everybody. So today I'm going to talk with you about a very uh, particular topic. So uh, I'm not going to talk about English literature, German literature, or Italian literature, or about philosophy or science or technology or history. I'm talking about all of this together. So um, how many times have you asked yourself when a specific movement developed, for example, or maybe uh, you mentioned an author and you didn't remember uh, which movement that the author belongs to. Well, the problem is that we tend to study uh, history of arts, of, 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 of literature, in the wrong way, in the opposite way. We tend to study an author and then to put it into a specific box, and that box is a specific currency. So probably we don't remember okay, which box we should use for that specific author. The reason is that we are studying in the opposite way. We should start, okay, from a timeline. We should start from the idea of what happened in that specific century, in that specific moment, okay. In general, obviously there are many differences from country to country, I'm talking about Europe in general. What was the, uh, the trend, what was the tendency, the, 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 the need at the time? And then we can understand why that specific author, okay, tried to use maybe a specific technique or he wanted to, um, to convey a certain message, okay. But we have to start from the idea that literature, arts, uh, science, um, philosophy, they are always real responses to real needs social needs of people, okay? And social needs are often also individual needs, okay? So, if we start to think in this way, we can also use a few tricks. So, if we imagine uh, arts, literature, philosophy, etc., uh, as a possible response to a social or individual need, we can ask ourselves, uh, which, uh, which, um, so which is the, the most important need, okay, for uh, the, the most important question that humanity has asked from the very beginning of the times? Well, the most important question probably is about uh, uh, life, existence, the reason why things happen, God or not God. Okay, death, life. So, uh, the, uh, the attempt at trying to understand the meaning of life, uh, can, we can say that it, uh, it, uh, um, it developed using the tools, the instruments that humanity had got, has got today as well, which are reason on one side, and uh, reason means also science, means also technology, means um, also all those kind of logical ways of reasoning. So reason on one side and instincts on the other side. So instincts mean, okay, mean they, okay, probably spirituality or uh, perceptions or uh, um, superstitions even, okay. Obviously, they can't coexist. So there was a sort of a, um, we can say, a sort of a use of one, just one of the two, in order to find a final answer. When the final answer couldn't arrive, it didn't arrive because it couldn't. We can't find the, the final uh, reason, the final meaning of life. Okay. It's not for us to understand, probably. And so, that specific tool disappointed humanity, okay? For example, they tried to use reason and science and everything, and for, uh, for a certain time it could even work. There were many discoveries and uh, explanations, and that was absolutely um, incredible and awesome, but then there was a limit, and science couldn't get over that limit. And that's the very moment when science, for example, disappointed, and so humanity had to go somewhere else, 
okay, to look for an answer. Somewhere else where, okay, to the opposite point. So they gave up completely reason and they tried with instincts again. And so instincts and so subjectivity and so uh, religion maybe and so uh, many other subjective ways of expressions but also in this case perception can arrive to a certain point and then it disappoints again and so when instincts couldn't give a final answer okay humanity gave them up and went back to reason so there is a sort of a continuous a cyclic up and down okay uh, of reason on one side and instinct and then again reason then again instinct okay and this is the eternal way okay that humanity uses in order to find answers okay they try they have this sort of a enthusiasm at first then a final disappointment and so they go back to the other side and they try again and this is the eternal uh, research of the human being. So um, I've um, got here uh, behind, uh, yeah, uh, behind myself here uh, a timeline. It's very easy, very easy timeline with just centuries, okay, from the Middle Age uh, to the 20th century basically, just in order to give you an idea of what I'm meaning. So, uh, we know that the Middle Age uh, last, we, we know that it started in um, uh, 476 uh, after Christ, obviously, and it, um, the, the, the end of Middle Age was uh, uh, when, uh, the, uh, when America was, uh, was disco discovered, so in 1492. So, what about Middle Age? What do you think? What was um, on the top at the moment, okay? Reason or instincts? Well, obviously instincts, okay? So we can say that, in fact, you see that uh, the car, this, this period in this part below my line, which is the part of the instincts and the part, okay, over here is the part of reason okay so middle age was in the part of instinct so uh, there was a superstition there were no uh, okay they were absolutely um, influenced by religion uh, there is there was a sort of a um, we can say uh, they um, refused any possible uh, explanation uh, scientific explanation of things uh, there was also refusal uh, of uh, classic of classic words works which are actually um, symbol of reason because they're very formal they're balanced okay so they are uh, really a sort of um, an ideal of uh, how the human being should use reason okay so um, the middle age was completely what well, was all about instinct all about instincts then, uh, after the discovery of, uh, uh, of America, but in general, during the 16th century, okay, there is the development of completely different movements. So I'm talking about humanism and Renaissance, okay, Renaissance. Renaissance means it's a, a, wor a word, also Rinascimento in Italian, Renaissance uh, uh, in, in French, okay, it means rebirth. A rebirth of what? Rebirth of reason. So we give up instincts here, okay, we go back to reason and uh, when we talk about reason, we talk about also classic works the human being is in the center of the of the universe again okay this is what humanism was about so human, you, the human being was at the center of the universe and could dominate the universe or at least he had the illusion that he could uh, start to dominate the universe and the rebirth is the rebirth of arts is the rebirth of uh, we can say researches connected also to the classic works and in this period science medicine or also are considered in a new way okay so there isn't sort of um 
uh, how can I say, a uh, um, sort of a connection, uh, okay, between health and magic uh, or uh, religion, but there was the real uh, intention uh, of uh, finding out answers, um, empirical answers, okay. Uh, in fact, they started to analyze the human body even if it wasn't completely allowed because they also used corpses for um, researches, etc. And that was something that was, that was forbidden at the time as well. But there was this in incredible um, desire, okay, to eventually also break the rules, break uh, the rules that maybe uh, the church was imposing uh, to get over, to eliminate superstitions and uh, try and understand in a logical and rational way how uh, how things worked okay inside the human being that was the micro microcosm sorry and inside the universe it was the macrocosm okay and in fact there is also a change in the study of the universe and uh, as far as the position of our planet Earth is concerned, okay, at the time. It was also refused. I'm not saying that everyone believed in this new uh, power of science. That was refused. It was a great struggle, a great fight. But the final aim was to eliminate uh, uh, instincts and, su and superstitions and try uh, to be as um, scientific, as objective as possible. But also in this case, okay, science could arrive to a certain point and then it disappointed again because the human being couldn't go farther, okay, and so they had to stop and there was another uh, sort of a change, okay, they gave up reason again and they tried with instincts, okay, once again. So during the 17th century there is uh, this period, we call it Baroque, okay, in which the personal, the subjective, um, we can say, expression uh, in arts in general is absolutely um, disconnected from uh, rules, uh, is absolutely refusing the idea of a pure form, a pure line, a pure balance that was typical of, classics, of classic works, okay? But also in this case, okay, when a subjective form uh, becomes more and more complex and uh, it isn't rational at all, it is destined to collapse on itself, okay? And this is why it disappoints again. And this is why the human being gets back to reason, gets back to reason with the enlightenment. Enlightenment is Obviously, the word itself, enlightenment, light, means uh, that they uh, try to use um, uh, the, uh, the light of science, the, the light of reason, the light of objectivity, empiricism, in order to uh, give, uh, give answers, to develop technology, to develop uh, um, also um, new techniques. Uh, it was a period of discoveries, it was a period of, uh, uh, of new um, also ways of production. And um, we, I, al I always um, re remember that, uh, that, that, that important thing that you, during mm, 18th, 19th century, especially in the England, we've got, and also Germany, we've got the Industrial Revolution. But Industrial Revolution means also Agricultural Revolution, it means uh, Transport Revolution. Transport Revolution means that uh, goods are can move more, more quickly, okay, faster, but people move along with goods and ideas move together with people, okay? So industrial revolution it doesn't only mean that there is more production, okay? But it also means there are more opportunity for people, okay, to um, share ideas, okay? They travel faster, ideas and new uh, possible 
uh, discoveries and so ever. So, um, obviously, uh, this is uh, okay, also a period that finally uh, creates a sort of a disappointment, but um, uh, even if there is another shift, okay, because obviously enlightenment means reason up in sixth round, and then we go back to the 19th century go back no we go forward to, to romanticism and also in this in this case we have another shift from uh, reason to instincts okay but uh, when um, one of this period are really um, you can say they they give their results okay even if we go on and even if we forget or try to forget okay what happened before it is completely impossible to eliminate the new, uh, okay, the changes, okay, that happened during the previous period. For example, uh, during the 18th century in England, we got the rise of the novel, the, no the modern novel, I mean. So, uh, a romance, uh, it arrived to an end and uh, the novel okay was an absolutely modern um, way of writing literature that was extremely connected to factual things okay to economical things uh, while romance used uh, sort of a fantasy or fantastic environments fantastic uh, characters and monsters and heroes they had no real names and surnames real identities they just had a sort of a, a general characteristic that was extremely stereotyped okay there was this fight of good against against evil and um, magic surroundings and so on. Uh, during uh, this century during the the 18th century okay the new novel the English novel okay changed completely this way of interpreting literature okay and storytelling in general we have uh, um, works uh, novels okay which often are diaries or um, epistles uh, so they have um, very specific details about uh, when or where they were written and uh, um, characters had a very specific identity they had a name and a surname a place uh, where they lived or they were born and they had a very economical uh, purpose in life because their main purpose wasn't fighting against evil okay their main purpose was to achieve a social and economical development in life which reminds us of the picaresque novel that was in the 16th century in Spain okay that was another period where reason were, was up okay also in this case enlightenment reason is up and so there is this desire to um, to have an evolution to improve okay and to get a better condition as far as society is concerned economics are concerned okay in personal uh, life is concerned okay so feelings are less important now okay uh, or religion or other uh, or other values there is a, in this case the values are the values of the middle class the rising class okay so even if when even if we uh, go back to instincts in the 19th centuries because we go back to romanticism all these elements we have achieved uh, can't be forgotten okay because the novel will always re remain like this. Also, uh, in the 19th century, during the Victorian age, for example, okay, when you have the uh, Victorian novel, Victorian novel obviously will um, take some features from Romanticism, but the general idea is the evolution of the first uh, modern novel that was born basically in the 18th century. Okay. So, uh, anyway, during the Romanticism, well, during Romanticism we have a complete uh, um, uh, rejection of everything that uh, Enlightenment meant. And so we go back to feelings, we go back to subjectivity, we go back to um, a sort of a spiritual vision of uh, nature. 
nature is considered an uh, organic living all okay uh, and uh, in and the poet especially the poet prophet it's called like that in England the poet prophet is trying to interpret nature because he is able he has got this special gift to get something that uh, other people can get and he can uh, interpret that something and uh, give it back and convey that through poetry through arts in general okay this is the role of the artist in this case and it is uh, connected with instinct obviously with spirituality okay everything is alive okay nature is alive so this is obviously it's nothing to do with reason okay um, in England this is very clear okay it is more complex in Germany for example I made this example here in green okay because I wanted to explain that things aren't all always so linear so I, I, I'm trying now to, to give a very um, schematic very a very simple okay um, explanation of the evolution but obviously there are many different uh, uh, currencies and reasons why they develop this way in each country in germany for example there were these two currencies that developed in the same period they were uh, pietismus okay and pietismus was uh, uh, absolutely connected with a very subjective idea of spirituality a very individual idea of spirituality then it developed um, into um, sturm und drang that was the first step towards uh, romantique which is the the same as romanticism it's not exactly the same because obviously Obviously, currencies are different okay in the different countries but anyway the idea is similar to the English romanticism the Italian romanticismo um, so pietismus was a, a sort of a uh, we can say the first step the root okay um, to uh, create then sermon drang uh, so Goethe okay and uh, uh, romantic at the same time at the same time uh, there was the development of the, Auf the Aufklärung the Aufklärung is the same current as uh, enlightenment in England uh, or Illuminismo in Italian okay they developed exactly in the same period but they we can say that they uh, led to two completely to opposite uh, directions okay romanticism on one side and enlightenment on the other side so um, we can say that there, are, there can be also different answers okay to the great questions of life and these ans these answers can all can be found at the same time in the same place um, back to our timeline uh, so hi I said that romanticism was typical of the 19th century um, and then we um, move towards to find the 20th century 20th century is divided into two parts okay there is a little part a little period at the very beginning of 20th century which is characterized by positivism which means science but the most important part of the 20th century is characterized by modernism in england or the period of the decay which is the decadence in germany decadentismo in italy as well uh, it means that reason is abandoned at all okay we go back to instincts in this case this is a little bit more uh, tragic because instincts aren't enough also in this case to give answers and so um, the uh, we uh, kind of leave a um, double disappointment okay disappointment coming from science on one side and disappointment coming from from instincts on the other side anyway it is a completely subjective period and uh, uh, it, it is extreme we arrive to the point of losing completely identity there is a so-called disintegration of the ego so of identity basically the human being isn't able to uh, uh, to understand who he is uh, and uh, it is because of uh, we can say a lack 
at the moment of um, social certainties. We are going towards the two world wars in this period, for example. Um, and there is also um, a sort of a response uh, to uh, the um, uncertainties that came from the idea of relativity, okay? Relativity, uh, this is the period of Einstein, for example, okay, as far as science is concerned. Uh, this is the period of Freud that who also gave the first interpretation of psychology. Uh, for the first time he uh, mentioned, uh, he um, talked about um, another side of the individual that uh, was a hidden side, was the unconscious side. He talked about the individual as a sort of a, an iceberg, okay, and he, he told that the, uh, the most, uh, okay, the, the, the greatest part of the individual was lying under the surface, okay, and that part was the unconscious side. Um, then there was uh, just a, a little, a small part that uh, is there for everyone to see, but that is the ego, and that is just a little part of uh, of the individual, and uh, this is not the most important, the most powerful one. There is also uh, another small part between uh, ego and um, the unconscious side he calls uh, it is which in German is like uh, the personal pronoun it okay so there is a part okay between uh, the ego and the is it is called über ich it means uh, super ego and uh, that part is a sort of a filter and that filter allows only certain emotions and behaviors uh, come up, okay, to the surface, okay. The rest, all of them are sort of, a, they're compressed, they are um, hidden, okay, in the unconscious side, in the A's, only a few behaviors, beliefs, perceptions, they can uh, come up. To the surface, so they can um, we can say they can pass okay through this filter, which is the super ego. Uh, this is obviously a completely new uh, idea of considering the individual himself, uh, and many certainties are completely destroyed right now. Um, there are some authors in Italy. Uh, during the Cadentismo, one of them uh, is Pirandello, Luigi Pirandello, uh, and uh, he um, wrote, he writes some novels in which he talks specifically about this topic. He says that um, uh, the, the man, or the human being in general, okay, is uh, one, because uh, he is basically, he has always considered himself as one, okay, but he is also uh, a thousand different people because every single perception that other human beings have of him, of himself, are true, are real. As real as the uh, idea that he has okay, of himself. So he is one but he is also a uh, hundred thousand uh, <laughs> different people and so basically he is a nobody. So reality doesn't exist. Reality is an illusion. Reality is a sort of a... Um, it's something that uh, we can eventually imagine but uh, if someone else tell, tells us something else then probably he is right. And so there is no certainty. This is very strong. Uh, there are um, different authors in this period, in different countries, that uh, try to uh, face this um, complete uh, uh, disorienting uh, feeling of the human being. Uh, Pirandello, Svevo in Italy, Joyce in, in England, for example, they developed this, this idea of the anti-hero. The anti-hero is a person who can't actually fight uh, because there is nothing to fight for. Because the human being isn't able to fight. 
because the human being isn't able, period. Uh, so Joyce in, in England, Virginia Woolf too, um, Proust, Marcel Proust uh, in, fr in France, okay, Le Cherche du Temps Perdu, while Joyce wrote uh, the Ulysses, for example, The Dubliners, and Virginia Woolf, uh, The Lighthouse, or Mrs. Dalloway, uh, Pirandello, Uno Nessuno Centomila, Il Fumatia Pascal. Uh, in Germany, uh, for example, um, Musil, Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften. So there are many authors that tried to understand, to develop this topic. Obviously, here the reason couldn't play any role. Okay, it played no, no roles at all. There was no reason here. Reason was considered an illusion. It was something impossible. Okay. Instinct, yes, instinct could be eventually the only way to try and analyze this situation, but it was anyway, um, it wasn't enough, okay, anyway. So, um, this is what modernism was about, then we have other currencies, we have postmodernism, etc. Uh, and uh, also arts, in this case, they try to um, explain, uh, also during, during this period, during the 20th century, we have, for example, Picasso, we have different ways of explaining how different perspectives can be perceived at the same moment, given different, uh, different different um, exceptions of reality. So, literature is uh, uh, trying to uh, face the same difficulties that also, uh, I don't know, that also other arts were, were trying to, to, to face or to explain. And philosophy as well, philosophy as well, okay. In fact, for example, um, during the yes during the, the 20th century the german philosopher friedrich nietzsche developed um, the idea of the übermensch uh, that was the idea of a man that had to be übermensch it's a super man okay what well, it didn't mean that uh, um, this man had superpowers or that he he was able to do more than others it meant that the ubermensch had the uh, ability to um, understand his own tragic situation to understand that uh, there is no fine no real final aim or prize in life or after life okay he has to accept his tragic, his dramatic condition and to accept that uh, the cyclic um, development of history um, is always the same and so there is no way out, okay? And instead of getting completely crazy, okay, or desperate, the Übermensch is able to look deeper into his own reality and to go on and to wish what the world imposed him to, to live, okay? So this is a way, okay, to, um, we can say, to face this tragic destiny. Uh, and to find strength inside himself, basically. So, obviously, I've been, uh, okay, it's been a, a long trip here, but I've tried to, 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 to obviously, to, to, to talk about the summary of all these movements. But the general idea is that we have always to start from the needs of the human being at the time, okay? If we are talking about a period where um, we have pestilences, for example, or other diseases, we can think that uh, people is um, developing arts or literature. This is not a priority, okay? The most important thing is to, to, to get some bread for their children, okay? So if we know that that specific period in history was just poor or dramatic, probably literature, arts, philosophy, everything, okay, uh, was just trying to uh, explain the reasons why it happened uh, or to find a way out. Uh, they won't be probably talking about poetry or whatever. Uh, Shakespeare, 
Shakespeare. Uh, he lived during the Golden Age, so during the, uh, the kingdom of uh, Queen Elizabeth I Tudor. Um, he uh, was extremely lucky because <laughs> uh, if, if he had lived before, <coughs> he couldn't have become that famous or he couldn't have uh, found, um, founded his um, theater, the globe, etc. Because there was a pestilence, theaters were closed, okay, because obviously it was too dangerous because of this pestilence of the disease to create places of aggregation, so theaters were completely closed, okay, and people couldn't care less about literature or about tragedies or comedies, they already had tragedies in their households, okay. So we always have to remember what happened at the time, okay? Why could Martin Luther in, uh, uh, in uh, the 16th century um, create uh, or anyway um, develop his uh, uh, reformation uh, and uh, the Protestant church uh, and he also translated uh, the Bible um, into German and in this way he created a sort of a general rule for the German language and so we have finally the Neujoch Deutsch which is the modern language so he is one of the father of the English lit of the German language. Why during the 16th century? Because that was the period of Renaissance, it was the period of humanism, it was a period when they could be more detached from the, uh, the, the power of the church, okay? And history was changing and the German areas were starting to have more independence from the Pope and this is why he could find okay, a place in history to develop that. So everything is always uh, intertwined, everything is always connected and we have to start from what's happening now and then we can think about what people uh, write or uh, I don't know, paints or things, uh, whatever. So this is my general idea. So always think about this ping pong thing, okay? This is a creek, okay? Uh, reason goes up, then it disappoints and goes down, and then it is uh, instincts disappoint also, and so reason goes up again. And this is always a ping pong uh, way of uh, <laughs> trying to find the answers, okay, as far as the meaning of life is concerned, okay. Thank you so very much for listening. I hope that this general uh, uh, picture could be useful for you. If you have any doubts or any questions, just leave me a comment below and thank you very much very much for listening and see you very soon with English literature bye